All right, IB chemistry students, time to talk about the parts of an atom. We're going to address topic two, the first few parts of it anyway, with this set of slides. My big advice to you, if there's something you think is worth writing down, pause the video, write it down. If I'm going too quick to follow along and write, remember, it's a video. You can pause it and do it in bits and pieces. Let's roll. One of the most convincing arguments that I have for the existence of atoms has to do with how we break things apart. If I take a window and I throw a rock at it, the window is going to break into a whole bunch of pieces. Not really predictable into how many and how large those pieces are, or what ratios I'll get from big to small pieces. That's proof that the window is not made of several little building blocks put together on a macro scale. However, if I start breaking things down on a small scale, I get some very predictable results. For example, the electrolysis of water always separates into two volumes of hydrogen for every one volume of oxygen. I get that same ratio every single time, that H2O ratio. That's not surprising for us because we know the term H2O. When people first started looking at the idea of atoms, the idea that matter is made of little building blocks, and they realized that they could break things apart and get the exact same pieces every time, that was a pretty good indication that there is a tiny defining piece of matter called an atom. We've since learned a lot about atoms, but we do need to know where we came from. One of the first modern atomic theories of uh, atoms, and by atomic theory I mean a theory that was based on evidence, was done by Dalton. First part Dalton's, uh, of Dalton's atomic theory is that elements are made of tiny atoms, and that all atoms of an element are identical. For a gold atom, matches every other gold atom. And different elements have different atoms. The reason iron and gold are different is because they have different atoms. That was Dalton's uh, premise in his atomic theory. He stated that atoms can combine to form compounds, which are always made of the same ratios of elements. Sodium chloride is always one sodium to one chlorine. And Dalton stated that atoms cannot be created, subdivided, or destroyed in a chemical process. He specifically didn't think that atoms had any smaller piece. They weren't made of anything else because he couldn't observe it. One of the important things about Dalton's work is it's based on experiment, and he could not experimentally find smaller pieces than atoms. So he didn't include a smaller piece in his theory. It wasn't until several other scientists came along to help out that we came up with some idea of what an atom is made of. One of those folks is J.J. Thompson. And J.J. Thompson was working with a cathode ray tube invented by a guy named Plucker. Uh, Crookes is another scientist who uh, played a role in the invention of cathode ray tubes and their applications. Um, the cathode ray tube works by having a partially evacuated glass vessel, which basically means a tube where most everything gas-wise has been evacuated from it. It's nearly empty. It's close to a vacuum. There's a small sample of a gas. And then there's a phosphorescing, or pardon me, a, pardon me, a fluorescing uh, interior lining. And when this is connected to high voltage, current with a lot of pressure across it, we get a glowing line, as you see in figure B, that starts to appear in the center. When J.J. Thompson saw this, he was pretty amazed because he knew that the only thing inside were a few atoms of a gas. His idea was that these little bits of glowing particle, whatever they happened to be, were coming from those atoms. And when they responded to a magnetic field and would curve, that was proof that they had an electric charge. Now, J.J. Thompson called these things negative corpuscles, but uh, several others coined the term electron. Uh, I'm pretty happy about that. Corpuscle just, it sounds gross. So what did he learn? The cathode rays are negatively charged. They responded to a magnetic field. And because there was nothing in the tube except a few gas atoms, the, the, whatever it was had to come from the atoms. And he found that all gases could produce these rays. It wasn't specific to his first sample. So he concluded that all atoms have a tiny negative particle that can be removed. And, you know, the corpuscles thing, yeah, anyway, electrons stuck, and I'm glad for it. Now, Thompson did have a dilemma. He couldn't create any positive cathode rays or anode rays. He couldn't find any rays that were positively charged. Now we know now, because we've had lots of years of experimentation, that electrons are small and have very little mass and because they're on the outside of an atom are very easily removed. So it's easy for us to get a beam of electrons. Protons that are more massive, that are held in place in the nucleus by the strong force, are not something that fly freely through uh, through a tube of any sort. Now Thompson had a guy named Ernest Rutherford in his life, a great person if you want to do a little research. He was a student of Thompson's 
and Thompson extended one of his challenges to Rutherford. Thompson was getting all sorts of great acclaim for his uh, discovery of the electron and this uh, value of these cathode rays. Um, but he went to Rutherford and said, Rutherford, we need a more complete model of an atom. Thompson had a plum pudding model, the idea that electrons are embedded in just a general positive region. And he wanted someone who could test this. Well, Ernest Rutherford was the dude. Rutherford worked with alpha particles. Alpha particles, as far as radioactive particles go, are big and they're bulky. They're slow, relatively, but they pack a lot of wallop to them as far as uh, mass. As a matter of fact, an alpha particle is a, pretty much a helium nucleus. It's two protons and two neutrons. So they're, they're heavy. They're kind of a cannonball. And they punch through things. And that's what Rutherford was studying. He was looking at these cannonball alpha particles moving through. And he ran across a dilemma. A lot of his alpha particles, as they were passing through super thin materials, were being scattered or deflected off of their otherwise nice straight path. And this was confusing for them. You see, if Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom was right, nothing Rutherford could create, as far as alpha particle beams, should be deflected. But there was something causing a deflection. So Rutherford created uh, what he called the gold foil experiment. The idea behind the gold foil experiment was that he would take a very, very thin piece of gold foil, gold being exceptionally malleable, you get a very, very thin piece. And he shot this very thin piece with a, a beam of alpha particles. Surrounding the device was a bunch of photographic paper. It would respond if those alpha, alpha particles hit, uh, hit and would indicate where the alpha particles were landing. Rutherford thought that his uh, little layer of gold was so thin and the atoms had to have been spread super thin that their plum pudding nature could be observed and this beam would pass right through them like a bullet through jello. Uh, that he'd just get one little spot on the other side on his photographic film. Well, he was pretty surprised. About one in every 8,000 particles actually bounced back. That blew his mind. Now, he was a great researcher. The idea that he put the foil completely surrounding it rather than just in the intended target range was a really smart idea even next to his projector, the device that was shooting the alpha particles, so he could observe these. Good for him for that lab design. He was thoroughly amazed by this. He said, it's as if you shot a thousand cannonballs at a sheet of tissue and had one bounce straight back. Imagine that. You got a sheet of tissue paper hanging off a clothesline, and you shoot a cannonball at it, and it goes right through. The next one goes right through. The next one goes right through. And then randomly, one of them bounces back. That's what an alpha particle was, remember, that cannonball that could bounce back. This website is definitely worth, worth checking out. Uh, I'll upload the PowerPoint video so that you can link on it, and I'll try to add this to the YouTube video. The FET University, or pardon me, the FET website from the University of Colorado at Boulder has a fantastic model of Rutherford scattering, definitely worth checking out. Now there's one other piece of the atom we know about now called the neutron, and James Chadwick, a colleague of Rutherford's, gets credit for this. What Chadwick and Rutherford noticed is as they were looking at the masses of these newly discovered protons and the atoms from which they came from, there was some extra dead weight hanging around. They weren't sure what it was, but it didn't seem to contribute to the overall charge of the atom. James Chadwick did the work to prove the existence of the neutron. Largely what he did was he took a chunk of beryllium and, just like his uh, boss Rutherford, started shooting alpha particles at things. What he was getting off of this, once it happened, was a stream of neutrally charged massive particles. The masses seemed similar to the proton, nearly identical, but those alpha particles coming off, uh, pardon me, the neutrons coming off, as we've since named them, had no charge electrically. They didn't respond to that magnetic field the way a proton would. Thus, neutrons. So what do we know about these? Now, as far as the masses go, Measuring them in grams is really, really difficult. They're small. It can be calculated based on uh, based on how their magnetic or pardon me, how they respond in electric field. The amount of electric field force needed to move these particles can be done to determine their mass. But we really just said let's make up our own mass units for this. A proton is one atomic mass unit or AMU. A neutron is similar enough that we treat it as one AMU. The electron is incredibly small comparatively. It's so small that for most parts we can just say it as zero mass. It's not a truly zero mass particle, but for our calculation purposes of atomic mass, we can skip it. Additionally, electrons come and go. It's really tough to lock them down and get a good measurement. Electrically, 
Protons have a charge of plus one, neutrons are zero, and electrons are negative one. Protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus of the atom, small, dense, positively charged region of the atom, proved to exist by Rutherford's gold foil experiment. The electrons are found in orbitals around the nucleus, and we'll talk a little, more, little bit more about what the word orbitals mean. You've seen the Bohr model before. It's built off of that model, but uh, a little more detailed. Our current quantum mechanical model, or electron cloud model, is a lot more fun because it allows us to uh, really explain a lot of the behaviors of atoms. That's a good review. If you need help, keep me posted. Have fun.